Hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, welcome, although you've already had a session this morning, which I very much regret that I was unable to be at, but I heard it went fantastically well, and I look forward to watching the video of the uh, roundtable later on. Um, what we're doing now is uh, something that is part of an, an effort that I hope that the JCB will take part in and even perhaps be a leader in, which is figuring out new ways of presenting our research and the library's research for new audiences, different audiences, and in a way that is engaging uh, in the new world that we're living in, the digital world, the videoed world, um, where much of what we say seems to reverberate in all kinds of interesting corners. Uh, this is akin, these talks are akin in many ways to what we've started doing about a year ago, which is to hold our fellows' presentations uh, not at a secret undisclosed location outside of the reading room, but actually inside the reading room with the materials from the collection playing a protagonistic role in the presentations of the fellows. Uh, we have had uh, tremendous success, we've had wonderful presentations, and we're still working out the ideal way of doing that. But we're trying to make the library, as I mentioned last night, into a, an active place, a laboratory for these new activities, and these presentations this afternoon, this, this morning rather, are part, are part of that. Um, as I said, this is experimental, slightly out of the box, um, but we have selected four individuals that I have no doubt will be extraordinary exemplars of how this is, uh, how this is done. Uh, I um, am grateful to all four of them for agreeing to do this and to being our guinea pigs in this, but I have no doubt that they will be excellent models going forward and will encourage us to be able to speak concisely, imaginatively, and excitingly about our research. They are, in order of their presentation and the title uh, of that presentation, Matthew Restall from Penn State University, who will be speaking on the term encounter. Gordon Wood, Brown University, who will be speaking on the, on the subject of disinterestedness. Catherine Burns from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who will be sp uh, speaking on the Portuguese uh, idea of resgachi. And Sarah Newman from Brown University, who will be trash talking on the subject of Maya trash. I should also say that Matthew is a former fellow twice over. Gordon Wood is an emeritus professor of history at Brown, who has also served as the chair of the faculty liaison committee of the library for many, uh, for many years, recently uh, stepped down from that role. Catherine Burns is currently a long-term fellow at the library, and Sarah Newman is the uh, recipient of one of our Stewart Fellowships, which is a graduate student fellowship for students at Brown, um, and she should know, be known to you furthermore as Dr. Sarah Newman because she received her PhD about a month ago. So without further ado, clapping, clapping is appropriate. Without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to, uh, to uh, these four presenters who will have 10 minutes to excite us and make us enthusiastic about their research. Matthew. Uh, when Neil asked me what I thought of the JCBX talks idea, I was way too enthusiastic. I told him I thought it was wonderful. If I'd known he was going to make me do the first one ever, I would have told him it was rubbish or trash, should I say. So thank you, Neil. Um, I get 10 minutes. Thank you to Professor Mara Solari for doing the timing. We're all four of us determined to do 10 minutes. Uh, my subject is encounter. Start the clock. <laughs> Imagine history, the historical past, reduced to a simple diagram. A diagram that could serve, for example, as an icon for an app on your smartphone. That simple. Imagine the diagram is, let's say, begins with a square. Just a simple square. And the square might represent structure. 
Now, I realize in most disciplines in the humanities, you use that word, you're opening up not just a can of worms, but more like a, a rusty oil drum full of worms. So just bear with me on that for now. Just let's take structure to mean historical context, the setting of the scene. Now imagine an X in the middle of that square. Uh, the X marks the spot on a pirate treasure map type X. That's an event. Uh, could be any kind of event. Arguably, the historical past is made up of events. Uh, we most readily are going to think of big famous ones like the Battle of Waterloo, but it could be a couple of guys who run into each other in an alley behind a pub and have a conversation that has some impact on their on their lives, not the kind of thing we normally think of as a historical event, uh, but it is. That's part of how we all live and make history every day. Next stage. Imagine that of this X, these two parts are actually also the arrowheads of two arrows coming in. So now we have lines coming in from either side, and those arrowheads meet at the tip to form the X. The encounter is then formed at the heart of the event. Or put another way, the event is an encounter. And arguably, most historical events in the past are actually encounters. How do we know about these encounters? How do we know about this structure? To borrow a term from adjacent disciplines of literature, we follow the descriptions and the narratives that we're able to find as historians. And in following that, the lines then come into, into view. So initially, what I'm giving you is a, is a very flat, two-dimensional model. I understand that. Now, I'm going to jump to a couple of historical examples very quickly. And I've not picked these because I think they best represent um, the model that I'm presenting to you. They happen to be two projects that I've been working on at the John Carter Brown Library. Last year, mostly, but to some extent or another, since I first set foot in the wonderful reading room of the JCB 20 years ago. So the first historical moment is what happened on November the 8th, 1519, when Cortez and his fellow Spaniards and indigenous allies walked across the Valley of Mexico and met Montezuma, or Moctezuma, the emperor of the Aztecs. Uh, a peaceful diplomatic encounter in which Montezuma gave a speech of welcome to Cortez and welcomed him into the city. That moment has gone down in history for the last 500 years as a surrender. The speech is believed to be a speech of surrender. I suggest to you that the surrender is a lie. It never took place. It's an invention. That the story that has been inscribed on paper and in stone and in paint for 500 years is made up. It's wrong. So let's leave that hanging, that idea hanging. Obviously, in the remaining, how much I have, five more minutes, I'm not going to be able to convince you of that. So you're just going to have to believe me that it's possible that I'm right and that what everyone has been reading for 500 years is wrong. Next story. Now we jump south and on a few hundred years to the coast that is known today as the Maya Riviera a fleet of about 30 Spanish vessels sailing down the coast of the Maya Riviera, anchoring off the coast of Belize. Between the fleet and the coast are the Keys, the Belizean Keys. On the coast, where the city of Belize now sits, are a couple of thousand British loggers and their African slaves, and they've been waiting for this invasion fleet for a year. And in fact, for the whole century leading up to this, the Spaniards have repeatedly been trying to rip out this illegal British settlement from a part of the new world that they consider theirs. The ships anchor, the loggers and their slaves row out in rowing boats and, and canoes and fire guns. Um, Spaniards die, the ships turn round and they leave. And the Battle of St. George's Key goes down in history as a great victory for the British, for Belize, and becomes inscribed as a foundational moment in Belizean nationalist mythology. It is on, on an emblem in the middle of the flag, and it has been since the area was a formal British colony of British Honduras from the 1860s to the 1980s, and then since then there's been, it's been a, an independent nation. Uh, nationalist 
celebrations in Belize of independence every year, the equivalent to uh, the American July the 4th. Uh, they take place built around the day when the Battle of St. George's Key took place. So it's incredibly important. And now you know what's coming already, I'm sure, but I'm going to tell you. The battle never took place. Yes, the fleet came down the coast. Yes, they anchored. Yes, British loggers and their slaves rode out and fired guns. But they couldn't get close enough to actually have a battle. The ships couldn't get between the keys. The, the invasion force was badly planned. The ships were from Cuba. They didn't have experience of the keys. They couldn't get through there. Um, it's extremely unlikely that any of the British loggers or their slaves who fired their guns could even see a Spanish soldier or sailor, certainly not the whites of their eyes. Did Spaniards really die? Yes. Several hundred Spaniards died, um, not from being shot, but because the British defenders had an ally in the form of yellow fever. So when British spies went out to see what the Spaniards were doing, rowing out at night to try and see if they were gathering to come and invade, they saw sailors and soldiers being offloaded onto rowing boats and being put onto the keys where they were suffering the bloody flux and dying and being buried on the keys. Um, and when the death toll got close to 300, they turned and went away, and they wrote back to the King of Spain saying this was a great victory, and the British wrote back to London saying this was a great victory. You see where I'm going. Let's go back, back to the model. Thus far, the model I gave you, as I said, is fairly flat and static, rather like words written on a page. So now I want you to imagine it kind of popping up as if you've, if you've touched the icon on your, on your smartphone, and now you're entering the app, and it starts to become three-dimensional. So imagine this model now moving so that you can, either the model moves, or I, I think I'm supposed to stay on the rug so I won't start <laughs> dancing around, but you imagine moving yourself around and around this model, and then in the course of following all the descriptions and the narratives, that simple flat picture begins to take on in other dimensions. It starts to look very differently. And every time you move, now you're not quite sure what happened. You can't see, was there a battle? Wasn't there a battle? Does it matter if there was a battle? Why are people making things up? Why are people believing something for 500 years that never took, never took place? So my use of the word encounter is supposed to sort of prompt your imaginations to, to, to press that app on your, the imaginary app on your iPhone to open up the historical past and think of it as something that is a moving model in which invention, and, and I'm deliberately trying to be you know, provocative but not quite silly, invention and lies is absolutely at the heart of what we do as historians. And when we go into the JCB and look through those wonderful old books, part of what we're doing is trying to figure out where the big lies and the small lies are. Thank you very much.